Put your mind back more than a thousand years ago, and imagine living in one of the most important, powerful, and influential civilizations in the history of mankind, Byzantium. Now, come back to the present, and think about how little you hear it talked about. This was the continuation of the Roman Empire. The people living in Byzantium would have referred to themselves as Romans. It lasted for another thousand years after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Yet, Byzantium in the modern day remains a mystery to most. But within its rich history lies many stories, people, and events that makes Byzantium undoubtedly history's most underrated civilization. Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of History's Most, History's Most Underrated Civilization. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and we are delighted to welcome on um, another guest for today's episode. We have got Robin um, from one of the, well, in my biased opinion, one of the best and one of the long-running members of the history podcast fraternity, <laughs> I'm going to call it, for reasons that are unclear even to myself. Um, and Robin is going to talk to us today about Byzantium. Thank you for joining us. Robin. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm always happy to talk about Byzantium. It doesn't come up a lot in casual conversation, so this is a, <laughs> a great pleasure for me. Yes, that is true. Um, I've tried and failed <laughs> on numerous occasions. Um, well, first of all, given kind of what we've just hinted at there, at the fact that, yes, Byzantium probably doesn't come up in a lot of everyday conversations. Let's um, set the scene a little bit. Robin, you'll be able to do this better than me. Would you be able to kind of give us a you know, starting point of what is Byzantium? Absolutely. If there's any listeners out there tuning in thinking, mm, I know nothing about Byzantium, this better be good, then uh, you know, I'm ready to go <laughs> here. So <laughs> I'm assuming you know about the Roman Empire, that the Romans... Um, covered the entire Mediterranean with their um, political control. And so when we talk about Byzantium, we're talking about the eastern half of the Mediterranean. And that word Byzantium, we might talk a little bit more about later, but it's just a, a term to distinguish the eastern Mediterranean as it developed from the classical Roman Empire of, of Julius Caesar and so on. Byzantium goes on and on when the western half of the Roman world has started turning into something else. So again, you probably know about a little bit about medieval history, about how the world of France and Spain and Italy and Germany started to form into the countries they are now in the post-Roman world. Well, over in the eastern Mediterranean, that, that world didn't take shape for much longer. So as the Roman Empire began to disintegrate in the 5th century AD, a Roman Empire based in the Eastern Mediterranean continued on in what is today Egypt and Palestine and Syria and Turkey. At that time was still the Roman Empire. The Roman people were running it, calling the Empire Roman, and running things from Istanbul, which then was called Constantinople. And a government in Constantinople calling itself Roman continued on throughout medieval times all the way to 1453. So 40 years before America was discovered by Europeans, there were still people calling themselves Romans in the Eastern Mediterranean. Mm. And in order to not confuse people <laughs> with the classical Roman Empire of, of Jesus's day, we call it Byzantium. So there you go. And uh, uh, if you don't know about it, this is a, you are in a good place. You're going to learn some interesting things today. I think that's, that's a very interesting point. The fact that, you know, it's so close to like the discovery of America you don't think of these two things being like happening almost simultaneously 
it's really interesting and there's a few few things in history that are like that yeah i i had never thought about it that way i i of course knew um about the fall of Byzantium in the great siege of Constantinople in 1453, but I'd never really in my mind, it seems like such a different yeah. world, the kind of age of exploration to thinking about even kind of medieval Byzantium. But no, that is an interesting way of putting it. Thank you, Robin. Before we go any further, by the way, it is a matter of, I think I might be wrong in saying this. You'll probably correct me. Growing, dare I say controversy in the academic field of should we call it Byzantium should we call it the Roman Empire should we call it the Eastern Roman Empire should we call them Byzantines Romans even dare I say Byzantines <laughs> what do you, what's your stance Robin yeah so uh, again for anyone um, who doesn't know uh, yeah, Istanbul used to be Constantinople the city of Constantine Constantine however you want to say it and before the Emperor Constantine renamed the city after himself, uh, the Greek-speaking colony that was there was called uh, Byzantium, and hence mm -hmm. why this empire based on Constantinople was termed Byzantine. Um, the term was coined, I think, around the 16th century in, in Western European scholarly circles. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a particular... Um, source of confusion because there are direct descendants of those eastern romans today they are um, the people of greece mm -hmm. who when they formed a nation state uh you know along the lines that were being established after the french revolution when when countries started to define themselves you know we are french people so this country is france the greek speaking people who could have called themselves romans based on their historic identity um, instead called themselves Greeks for various reasons that we won't get into in this moment. But that, of course, causes great confusion. So you have this empire that, <laughs> you know, doesn't have a direct um, uh, verbal connection to a country of today mm. and that then is renamed Byzantium. So this this is a great source of confusion and scholarly debate. I think um, generally now scholarship accepts that at least the elite did call themselves Romans throughout that period, but debate still rages about lower down for your, for your ordinary people, how they would have conceived of themselves. Um, would they have called themselves Romans or identified as Romans, particularly those living a long way from the capital. So th that debate goes on, but I think generally now Byzantium is accepted as just a scholarly term to make it clear, which, period of history you're studying and roman is the name that the elites at the very least definitely called themselves throughout that period already this is fascinating and this is just the name of the place <laughs> that we're talking about so i think you know one of the great things um about delving into let's go with byzantium um is the fact that like you say there is, there is no modern state it likes studying the british empire you can obviously Britain, um, even I think to some extent, people studying the Roman Empire, it almost has a home still in Italy and Rome that is tangible. Yeah. But the fact that this state, which was a great power for a thousand years, doesn't really have a, a modern state you can tie it to, I think is actually something that, you know, both makes it harder to study or, or less people kind of come across it. But equally, I think makes it totally fascinating because it's a, it's such a vivid link to a, a totally bygone age, a different map of Europe and the world to what we know today. Absolutely, and for anyone in any doubt, the um, the centre of of Byzantium is now Turkey, which obviously is yeah. a is a, a Muslim country, and Byzantium is very much a Christian civilization, and so that creates another dichotomy and. Uh, you know, when you go to Turkey today, you be, you'll you very much be directed by the tourist um, industry towards Turkish things. So that, you know, creates another level of sort of confusion or, or mystery about Byzantium.
a complete annex, if you like, side note here is that I didn't realize, but that um, there was still large Greek speaking, well, maybe not necessarily large, but a Greek speaking populace in uh, the kind of heartland of Byzantium, the Asia Minor or Anatolia, right up until the 1920s, I believe, till only 100 years ago. Mm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that's, I mean, we, you know, we, we don't want to go down too many rabbit holes, no. but, but <laughs> yeah. that is absolutely true that um, modern nationalism, um, that post French Revolution world, yeah. led to these mass deportations of both Greeks from Turkey and Turks from Greece to separate the populations, you know, in anticipation that they would start turning on one another. Uh, now that these states were being defined in national terms. Yeah, it's always, um, I think, one thing to bear in mind when you're looking at history is that the concept of ethnicity being tied to nationality is actually quite a modern modern one. Um, right, so what we're going to kind of do with this episode and this interview is we're going to think about why Byzantium is such an underrated civilization. What makes it so great? What makes it worthy of study? And what makes it something that actually, if you didn't know much about it, it's worth finding out so much more. Um, and that's really where Robin comes in. Um, so I believe, Robin, you've got three things you want to kind of pitch to us and pitch to the listeners of why is Byzantium so, you know, exciting? What is it? What is it? Why should we be interested in it? Yeah, well, I think um, I, I have come up with three, and I think the first one is just to the general fan of history, um, which I'm imagining most people listening are. And I think the natural way to get to Byzantium is through the Greco-Roman world. And I'm a big fan of you know, those famous stories, like I imagine you are, of the, the Persian-Greek Wars, 300 and all that, and then Julius Caesar and um, all the famous Roman stories, Hannibal and, and so on. And uh, if you're into history in that way, these big political conflicts, these dramatic wars, these fascinating stories, and you don't know Byzantium, then my pitch would be to you, you've got another thousand years of those stories to enjoy and you haven't, you know, you don't even know what's in store for you. Um, and Byzantium gives you a very rich variety of experiences if you follow the Roman state through that period. So you might be used to the stories of the Roman Empire, you know, are generally, you know, the Romans being indefatigable and conquering the whole Mediterranean and, and so on. With Byzantium, you get you get those stories, you get times when they're conquering and when they're um, in a strong position, but you also get them at a very low ebb fighting, very dramatic um, conflicts where the whole survival of the civilization is, is on the line. Um, and you also get them kind of being the conquered and, and having to fight um, guerrilla campaigns very much in the way we, we now think of, um, you know, Vietnam or Afghanistan, um, you know, there are now, you can hear stories about Romans in those same positions, digging un into the ground to hide and hiding up in the hills and fighting enemies from this great disadvantage. So the, the variety of dramatic stories you get on that sort of uh, state army level, I think is is exciting. And when you go away from warfare just towards uh, more everyday human experiences you know you get dramatic tales again of rich variety of, of families pulling together in very hard times uh, as well as stories of families turning on each other and <laughs> mothers blinding their own sons to gain power uh, the, again the variety of uh, irene <laughs> <laughs> exactly the, the richness of that is is compelling i'd say so um I would I would pitch it along those terms. And if you do know a little bit about Byzantium and you think, well, it's all very religious and um, very intolerant Christian stories, you know, I'd say there definitely is some of that. And there is also those who fought against the, the elites and risked, you know, their own lives to try and tell the truth to power. And so, yeah, that would be my pitch is, is 
if you enjoy those kind of Greco-Roman stories, you have a lot uh, more you haven't heard of uh, waiting to be discovered. Uh, yeah, I really do like that. You know, I, I, I like the idea of, you know, falling down a rabbit hole uh, uh, and of something that just has so much information out there. You know, I, I love the idea of getting involved in, in untapped yeah, well, untapped, you know, you know because I am more of a fan of history than, you know, a historian. And so for me, I really do like to just fall into to reading about something. And with the, 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 uh, the Byzantium, there is just so much stuff out there, you know? I, I I echo that. I mean, when I I can't remember, I can't put a you know a date on it of of when I first discovered that Byzantium was a thing. But I I do I was obviously you know I I think I was probably you know this shows me as a massive history nerd. But it would probably have been playing like a strategy game when I was probably about twelve or thirteen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something set in medieval times or something something like medieval. Total War II, something like this, and Byzantium being there, and thinking, what's that? And then maybe a quick Google search or something and finding out it's just the Roman Empire, but a thousand years later. And I think I remember running to my dad or someone who wouldn't have cared and saying, did you know the Roman Empire survived <laughs> for another thousand years? Um, but it's exactly that of when you already have an interest in the classical world, the ancient Greece and Rome, and it's just this amazing, for me, it was this amazing moment of realisation of what? That's still happening. That's, that's still that's going on. Good. There's more of it out there. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, um, I mean, there is, I think it's, it's almost because there's an extra thousand years, it's almost more colorful. Like you're saying, Robin, there's more variety. There is, I mean, I always found the late stage Roman empire in the West fascinating because, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, as someone who kind of specialised in interwar in the 20th century, I just love crumbling civilizations. <laughs> um, but I always found the kind of fall of the road Western Empire very interesting. And, and to know there's this one struggling on, and at times actually doing very well, like you say, but the, there's a whole nother kind of story of a thousand years of sometimes struggling on and sometimes doing really well. And I think, like you say, there's almost more variety to it because of that. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I can give you pitch number two, if you like, um, which sure, would be, yeah, yeah. Well, so moving on from kind of the, uh, the stories and the drama um, that might be your thing, if you're, let's say, more scholarly, more academic, or you just want to know how does world history fit together, um, then I would say you will know a lot more about world history if you learn about Byzantium. And in a way, the modern world only makes sense if you understand Byzantium's role in its development. And uh, I jotted down about eight examples of this. Um, I'm sure there are many more, uh, and I'll, I'll try to hit them all briefly. But this is just to give you a flavor of um, Byzantium's influence on the world at large. So Christianity, in the form that has come down to us, was formed in the Eastern Empire. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you the deep ways in which that has um, affected all aspects of life mm. um, in the West. But if you, if you kind of learn about how that developed, you, you find out very interesting things. I mean, one, one of those is how does Romanness as it was at the time, imprint itself on Christianity. Um, you know, Christianity is formed from, uh, you know, a, a group of Jewish men in a particular part of the Roman Empire. Once it becomes the religion of the whole empire, how do the two sides sort of compromise with one another? How does Christianity make itself acceptable to a Roman elite and vice versa? How do the... Um, how do the Romans, you know, come to understand and appreciate what Christianity is offering? And, uh, you know, a, an example of that might be the way, um, you know, a lot of 
pagan gods were sort of patron saints, as it were, of particular uh, towns and cities across the Roman Empire and particular professions. Um, and of course, once the world becomes Christian, suddenly you have literal patron saints of all these things. So you sort of see, hmm, you know, there's a there's a through line there. There's a way that um, the two sides have adapted and said, well, we really like this aspect of the way we understand the divine. How can we how can we get that from this new religion that's becoming uh, the thing that everyone believes? And of course, there's the question of how did it become the thing that everyone believes? You know, how did how did Christianity take over the empire? But equally, how did the empire then force people, uh, for want of a better word, how did conversion happen? All that story, um, to take a <laughs> to take a kind of frivolous modern example, I always think about the Harry Potter books. Um, <laughs> But the Harry Potter books reached such a level of popularity that it became difficult to be someone who said, oh, I, I haven't read them and I don't want to know about them. It reached a, point, a tipping point where it became easier to read them or at least learn about them so that you could be a part of the conversation. And Almost you had to, you know, have a working knowledge of Harry Potter to understand popular culture. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn about how religions kind of gain mass acceptance and appeal that story you know is very much in byzantium in the in the early part of the empire in the eastern mediterranean is obviously where it begins yeah. i'd um, love by the way sorry to interrupt yeah. but the implicit their comparison between harry potter and jesus christ any <laughs> <laughs> further investigation outside of these realms but yeah yeah absolutely well, since we're treading on on um, sacred toes, uh, Islam <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Islam was also born, you know, in a in a very uh, Byzantine affected context, and uh, the pages of the Quran uh, feature several stories um, that circulated in in Byzantine communities um, about Jesus and about uh, the relationship of man to God and. Uh, Islam, of course, became the sort of state religion of the caliphate mm. that formed in the seventh century, and and that caliphate formed itself on around the contours of the the Roman Empire that it was um, pushing out. And so again, uh, we think of Islam and Christianity as these kind of poles that that uh, are in contrast to one another, in conflict with one another, but they they come from a very similar place and, and that place is heavily connected to Byzantium. So um, to understand jihad, to understand the ideas of the caliphate and, and things we've been through with ISIS in recent times, it can help to go back to Byzantium. Um, to take that story onwards a few centuries, uh, the Crusades, uh, I believe you've, you've done an episode mm. on the Crusades and you have another one coming up. They are, integral to the byzantine story there would have been no crusades without byzantium being in need of assistance as the middleman um and that enmity between western europeans and and now americans and the islamic world began there with the crusades the, the, these were peoples who back then wouldn't have had much reason to have conflict with one another there was the byzantine empire the, the eastern roman mediterranean in between them keeping them apart and suddenly the Crusades brought them together. Mm. And I think I think that whole story of how did we become a world sort of split into Christian and Islamic countries um, is told through Byzantium, that uh, the Byzantines did not see the big differences between the two sides that we do. Um, the, uh, the daughter of the emperor, Alexius Komnenos, um, wrote the history of the, the crusading period from the Byzantine point of view. And she describes the the Muslims on one side and the Latin Western Christians on the other and says, you know, they're both pretty similar <laughs> from our perspective. There's not a big difference between them, which obviously now we would see as a, a kind of an odd statement. But uh, there you go. Uh, to jump to more modern times, I would say the First World War is much more explicable if you've studied Byzantium. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the the Balkans are the uh, light that uh, starts the bonfire, and that mix of peoples in the Balkans goes all the way back to 
uh, Byzantium's handling of peoples migrating into that area. So um, one of the sticking points around what started the First World War was was Russia um, demanding that it would, you know, saying it would protect Serbia. Well, you know, why why are those two nations, um, you know, why do they have this bond? Well, they were both converted to Christianity by Byzantine priests and uh, their languages trace their way back to Byzantine Greek. And, you know, there are other conflicts there. You've got obviously Greeks and Turks at the time of the First World War falling out. You've got Croatians and Serbians going at each other. Most of this traces back to conflicts that happened in, in Byzantine times. You've, of course, got a country in the middle of the Balkans called Romania, which um, traces its its name and its identity to some extent f- from the Romans, from um, the, the Greek word, um, which you could translate into English as Romania, the Roman Empire, the country of the Romans. Mm. So that whole mess of uh, conflict that obviously pulled Britain and France and Germany and, and everyone else into war can has strong links back to the Byzantine period. And if one was being very broad, you could even extend that to the Cold War. Why Why was Russia so suspicious of Western Europeans and Americans uh, the the basic tension could be traced back to orthodox and catholic um fallings out uh between byzantium and the west kind and of the, long standing division in the european kind of christian world absolutely um i think uh you could you could also bring in you know european colonialism uh, a lot of scholars trace that back to the crusades back to Western Christians coming east and capturing not only Jerusalem, but eventually Constantinople Mm. and, um, you know, saying, well, we are on the right side. God's on our side. So we have the right to capture these places and educate them about how they should be doing things, you know, or you might say it's not really a, you know, it's, it's cynical human acquisitiveness being dressed up with religious ideas. However you want to put it, it comes back to, Byzantium. And to give you a final, slightly more frivolous example, uh, if you look at the mafia, um, which develops uh, in its Italian form, at least uh, in the 19th century, the mafia forms in areas which were formerly Byzantine and even down to today remain much stronger in the south and Sicily, which were uh, Byzantine controlled for a long time compared to their strength in the north of Italy, which was much more connected to the to the other Western European states in the, mm. in the Catholic world. So uh, there you go. Just a little uh, <laughs> a little taste of all the things one could connect to Byzantium uh, if you so wanted. I mean, I had not thought about so many of those points. I feel like we're now looking at like one of those those like notice boards that have been turned into a mad web of conspiracy. (laughs) I've got the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. I've got the Godfather. (laughs) I've got uh, Stalin and red tapes all connecting them. And it's all going to to Constantinople. (laughs) Um, I think you make a pretty convincing case, Robin, that we can't, you know, that Byzantium, although it's a civilization that, has now disappeared and you won't find it on the map anymore its impact very much still is kind of felt and the shape of the world it's certainly in the eastern mediterranean the eastern half of europe has still bears the imprint of of that um of that civilization yeah absolutely i mean one i like to say to uh, English people in particular, is that um, the wars of 1066 are very connected to Byzantium, that um, Harold Hardrada had served in the Varangian Guard, the imperial bodyguards of the emperor, before he went and was defeated in in 1066 in England. And then the uh, a lot of the defeated Anglo-Saxon soldiers departed after the norman takeover and went to constantinople to serve the emperor so something that is sort of key to to the way we teach english history in here in the uk is very is still very connected to byzantium and that never came up during my childhood no yeah i mean i 
you know, I am a history teacher and I teach, you know, 1066 Battle of Hastings is one of those essential things in shaping English history, at least, that is always taught. And I didn't know till very recently that Harold Hadrada had this background. Um, actually, I think it was your podcast that might have illuminated me to that. Um, <laughs> as a, you know, as a servant of, of the empire. And the idea that it's some far-flung corner of medieval Europe is really kind of exposed by the fact that so many people went there, whether it to be to ply their trade as soldiers or, or merchants, things like that, and the sense that you had here in medieval times, which, you know, actually something we were discussing um, with Gary of the French History Podcast in another interview that we've done, we're talking about the fact that really medieval times and he was talking about how it really changed in the Enlightenment, the fact that everyone would live their life or the vast majority of people would they'd live their life within 10 miles of where they were born. But actually, you look at Constantinople and you look at the Byzantine state, and, you know, that is so not true. Even within, you know, Byzantine Greeks, they've often migrated halfway across Europe to get to Constantinople to live. And then that's not worth even talking about Norwegians living there. Yeah. Norwe Norwegians? That feels like a rabbit hole we can go down. <laughs> well, Harold Hadrada um, eventually became the king of Norway, I think, through complicated affairs with his brothers. Mm. Um, but he, yeah, he had served in the Byzantine military, literally on the opposite side of the continent, um, made a bit of money doing so. You know, in the American educational system, we don't really get taught a lot about, you know, well, just, I mean, there's, I have a lot of complaints about about the <laughs> educational system, especially when it pertains to history. We we didn't really get taught a lot about um, Byzantium. I mean, of course, you know, we covered the Roman Empire, you know, the Western Roman Empire, but as far as it goes, I don't remember ever really diving into Byzantium like at all. And I feel like I feel like, you know, the points that you've raised there make a pretty compelling case as to why we should start talking about it in educational systems around the world. Yeah. I it's it's tricky, isn't it? Mm. Like um with high school students to know how much depth to go into, but um definitely uh, I've heard many university professors say students are turning up without a basic outline of of world history to go off, and that's that's quite a quite a gap in your knowledge if you're going to start writing essays uh, on on grand topics of mm. history. So before we um, institute a new curriculum for the world's schools, <laughs> um, shall we? move on to your third and final point about why Byzantium is so worthy of our attention, Pete, uh, Robin. Yeah, so um, this gets into um, what a lot of people like to use history for, which is as a kind of mirror to our own times. And um, I like I like Byzantium because it's so unknown, it can it can hold up a, a quite a twisted mirror that you, you, you didn't know existed. Um, to start with a, uh, a more lighthearted example, um, football hooliganism uh, is a big thing in uh, most of the world um, with kind of intense, passionate fans of their local soccer club um, uh, forming groups, sometimes called ultra groups. Mm -hmm. And, these tend to spill over from chanting and singing into violence, and then they can become connected to petty crime or even organized crime. Um, and so this is quite, it's quite an interesting phenomena and um, it gets talked about a lot today um, by commentators kind of looking at, you know, how is the modern state failing to create identities that form healthier bonds? You know, what is the appeal of these groups and, and the kind of, uh, you know, macho culture perhaps they, they lead to? And interestingly enough, these exact um, type of 
sports fans existed in Byzantium and their behavior was almost identical to modern um, football ultras. So these were the, the fan clubs of um, chariot racing in Constantinople. And um, this is kind of in the, in Christian Byzantium. So the gladiatorial contests um, where people are killing each other have kind of disappeared, but chariot racing remains hugely popular. And there's a period about 100, 150 years where these football, uh, these football hooligan types, um, these racing club fans are so passionate that they are regularly um, having street fights with one another. Some riots are turning very serious. Um, the most famous version of this is, is an attempt to bring down the government, the Nika riots that formed against Justinian. And so it's it's a it's a fascinating thing to study, you know, when you're looking at the modern world, speculating, well, how how can we change these groups to prevent, you know, violence or whatever? And, and you look at it and you go, well, maybe this is something in the human condition because almost the exact same things played out, um, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred years ago in a different setting. Humans behaved in exactly the same way, um, and so a nice flip of that um i've been thinking about recently is something some some of you may associate with byzantium which is kind of extreme religious devotion something we might think about more um byzantium a very christian place icons and churches are, are a big deal and the most extreme form of religious devotion were ascetics so these these are monks who go to physical lengths to show their um divorce from sinful behavior so if in your everyday life your sin is you know i've eaten too much i've i've lusted after my neighbor's wife those kind of concerns of the flesh these monks would go and live in the desert or go and live up a mountain so they've separated themselves from other people and then they would stop eating regular food they would survive on as little as possible so they would become very skinny become emaciated and then they might go a step further, kind of taking this renunciation of sin and the flesh to extreme lengths by uh, standing for days at a time, you know, not sleeping or even some sort of mutilating themselves. Now, this is a this is obviously very extreme human behavior, and it's very interesting in its own right. But if you were taking a kind of strange um, twisted mirror to our own times, it made me think about kind of uh instagram influencers mm. reality tv stars that today we would say that we um what we look for is, is people who are kind of physically extreme in terms of beauty and fitness and wellness and that we look up to people like that we might become obsessed by them we look to them for advice or guidance or, or a lifestyle that we envy and you might think well the two are kind of opposites what have they got to do with each other but a lot of those ascetic monks weren't doing this in silence. They were doing it in order to prove that they were worthy of giving advice and guidance and mm. cultivating followers, not yeah, just they sort of big followings, didn't they? Yeah. Wow. So not just disciples, but ordinary people who would come and say, please, can you bless me? Please, can you um, pray for me because I'm, I'm ill or I'm going on a journey or I need advice. And um, these monks, in many cases, were sort of replacing the old pagan temples where the collection of knowledge was stored. And now these holy men were able to say, um, you know, listen, lots of people have come to me with the same complaint you have. What you need to do is go and see this doctor or, you know, go and try this remedy or just to give people peace of mind. Like, you know, I, I bless you. Go away. Don't worry about this anymore. And so you kind of see two cultures maybe coming up with a similar figure, a charismatic figure from completely opposite points of view of what is ideal and enviable in how a human should look and behave. Um, so I th found that interesting. And um, the third example I'll, I'll give is a bit more speculative, but this is the realm of politics. And um, I was thinking about the question of uh that you kind of posed underrated civilization um why is byzantium underrated so i was starting to think about why do people rate other civilizations and um i think one of the reasons we 
often call back to uh, Athens and the Roman Republic in particular is their democratic elections and the you know that sort of um, sense of democracy being created is obviously very yeah. relevant to us today and has been for the last couple of hundred years that we see ourselves as, as developing that democratic tradition. And mm -hmm. Byzantium on the surface seems a long way from that because the emperor in Byzantium is seen as a somewhat divine figure. He's, he's styled as God's right-hand man on earth. He leads the religious ceremonies. Um, if you attack him, you will be executed, you know, so it seems like, well, this is an autocracy. This is a dictatorship, but when you study um, power politics in Byzantium, what emerges actually looks to me, um, you know, based on the work of scholars, obviously, as not that different to the way our um, representative democracies actually function today, that, that really the emperor is, is the head of a coalition that has formed of powerful elites and vested interests, and that attempts to unseat those emperors often look kind of like modern political parties forming against him and and you know in their case sort of violently overthrowing him but in our case kind of right we've had an election and you're out and our party is in and um I, a way to make this a bit more relatable might be the office of the american president mm -hmm. which was designed so i understand it to be part of a system of checks and balances yeah. that the the president would be more like a, a commander in chief and and a a nudger of the um senate and house and representatives you know he might push push them in directions but he wasn't intended to be the person who was running the country mm. and suggesting legislation and in charge and responsible for everything. but over time for various reasons and maybe just because humans find it easier to invest in one person, mm -hmm. perhaps the American president increasingly becomes like the Byzantine emperor, a figure people kind of expect to be most responsible for what goes well and is most to blame for what doesn't, even though under the surface that figure doesn't have control of all the levers of power in the way we sometimes popularly think of them. So, yeah. Uh, like any uh, like any civilization from the past, one can look at it in this sort of twisted mirror way. I, I guess my final comment on that, why would Byzantium be particularly underrated, is that I think Byzantium is, um, it has the kind of three um, strands we most associate with Western civilization. It is a Christian state, very self-consciously, it is a Roman state. It's very much run on uh, Roman laws, Roman engineering, things we think of as typically Roman. And it is, uh, it, it's a civilization that functions in Greek, in Greek thought and a Greek philosophy and Greek medicine and Greek ideas that we today celebrate are very much preserved and, and passed on in Byzantium. And so when you're looking back from a western country at at these sort of twisted mirror comparisons byzantium seems to me a natural place to go because it has these strong connections to things we value today mm, interesting that one of the things we actually said was sort of one of the tragedies of uh of the fourth crusade was the loss of so much uh, ancient classical greek art and architecture and, and literature as well that has been lost to us today um yeah, and of course, um, the center of Byzantium becoming Turkey even mm -hmm. more is lost. So there is the, yeah. there's a huge amount of mystery to do with Byzantium yeah. uh, and the things that might have survived. Yeah, because it was a real, almost like, um, I don't know what to call it, almost like a historical deep freezer in the sense that I believe a lot of what we now know about the classics and, you know, Plato, Aristotle, a lot of the actual physical texts survived in Byzantium and their survival there through to medieval times is why we have them today, um, which is kind of, you know, particularly when you think about how much those ancient texts influenced the Renaissance, therefore 
the scientific revolution, therefore the Enlightenment. Mm. <laughs> you know, you could just so, you could so run as far so as you want yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, I do, by the way, just want to say I am waiting for the day where that um, uh, some academic paper describes Saint Simeon as a influencer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe him just on top of a pillar taking selfies. I don't know. Something like that I want to <laughs> see happen. Um, I think one of the things that, um, for me, is always so fascinating about Byzantium and why, you know, what it, it does deserve to be kind of recognized as one of the top civilizations is how many times it almost comes back from the dead in the sense of, it is it is a hell of a survivable state. It has, to use a horrible modern phrase, bounce back ability. Um, <laughs> in the sense that it is down on its knees a lot. And yet it can come back and not just survive for a thousand years, but often come back, you know, with a vengeance. Um, why, why do you think that was? Why was Byzantium so strong almost because it's not it's not the same strength as the roman empire had is it it's not you know conquering all before it but it it, it i don't know it, it's able to just hang on in there and often actually do a lot more than just hang on in there for a very long time yeah i think um something that's quite particular to roman civilization was the need to have a capital city that was fixed and um, bigger than any other city around. Um, and I don't know whether that was uh, by design or, or accident. It probably came out of the Roman Republic, focusing so much power on elections happening in the city of Rome, you know, even forcing Italians from, you know, Milan or Ravenna, you know, well, if you want to vote, you have to you know, travel for, two months down the road to vote and then travel two months back to get back to work. Um, this led to um, when Constantinople was founded, uh, uh, it becoming uh, dominant in patterns of behavior and trade in a way that um, I think allowed a Byzantine civilization to survive. So I imagine most of you are aware, are aware that Istanbul sits on the very tip of Europe before um, uh, Asia emerges on the other side of the Bosphorus, which uh, at points is only, I think, about 500 meters across at its narrowest mm -hmm. point. Um, and so obviously um, traveling by sea is much quicker in pre-modern times. So you have a city that can sort of dominate the Balkans and uh, what's now Turkey. That all roads lead there, all sea lanes lead there. So as long as the city doesn't fall, um, the the whole civilization can recover because inside are the tax revenues and the cathedral church and the uh, bureaucratic and ecclesiastical administration. And so the whole land outside could be flattened. And as long as the center can then come back and march out and say, you know, we're putting things back in order. Um, the civilization can, can continue. Um, and I think probably um, when you peel beneath the surface of the details, um, it's all about legitimacy. It's all about what people accept. You know, that we, we currently accept that the government of our country is legitimate, that we believe we should go and vote. And that's, the right way to provide legitimacy for the politics that takes place. And we all agree on this. And the day we don't agree on this is when um, revolutions happen, civilizations fall. And so I suppose Constantinople convinced people on, on sort of either flank East and West, that it was the natural source of their government, the natural source of their defense. And because it kept surviving and coming back, people didn't, argue with them too much and so uh from that base they were able to expand and then retract over a thousand year period 
And I think that's the key. And um, whether he meant to or not, uh, Constantine founded a site that was incredibly uh, well defended, being on this little peninsula surrounded on three sides by the sea and so very hard to capture. And so that was key to this whole thing surviving. Yeah, I mean, is is there anything as well? Did did the inheritance of Rome, well, it gave it the legitimacy and, and kind of um, prestige that you're talking about. Do you get any sense from your, you know, lengthy studies of Byzantium that it was... You know, was it administratively precocious for medieval times? Was it a state that was, you know, much further down the road of development than its neighbours? I mean, I'm thinking about, to go back to 1066 a little bit, when I'm teaching it, the resources we have make, I don't know, perhaps slightly anglo-centric claims that in 1066 England was one of Europe's best administered and most wealthy nations and this is why it was such a great prize that so many you know kings of europe were looking to claim and then i in my brain i think <laughs> i think about constantinople with five hundred thousand people and a roman bureaucracy and that yeah most <laughs> west administered <laughs> state in europe not really um do you think is, is it is it you know is it, it was byzantium meaningfully ahead of its competitors in the sense of being that's Roman bureaucratic, professionalized civil service run state. Yes, I think so. Um, it's. Uh, I suspect um, there is a comparison there um, with what I just said. That probably, I'm assuming, I haven't studied uh, this period in in detail. That what people mean about England at that time is people naturally. Um, saw the country as one unit and mm. looked to one government to administer it. And that makes life so much easier than say the Kings of France who had to go around yeah. um, all these different regions, convincing people um, you owe me allegiance. And they would say, well, you know, you, you come past these mountains and, and it's, I'm in charge here. So um, England having nice, relatively flat farmland running out for hundreds of miles makes it easier to, to administer i suppose um yeah so on western european standards compared to the very decentralized france or god forbid we talk about the holy roman empire yeah it's it's a very kind of fairly centralized state absolutely and so what happens in uh, most of western europe is that a, a local lord a duke or a or a prince or, or whoever runs his sort of geographically defendable patch and you know, you have vassals and uh, fiefs and all these kind of recognizably medieval ideas um, about how you placate small uh, independent powers and uh, sort of unite them into something bigger. And this never develops in Byzantium. It is, as you said, run on old Roman imperial lines, which is you have one government in the center, you all pay taxes to the center, and we provide you defense. And Again, in that core um, where you run east out into Turkey and west out into the Balkans, um, the, the government of Constantinople was able to maintain that system. So instead of having to negotiate with local elites to say, you know, please give us some tax revenue, um, the, the bureaucrats and the soldiers were of one mind. No, we work for the government of Constantinople. And so, um, you know, it, the system was a much more similar in theory to a, a modern state where you pay your taxes and therefore the center always has money to kind of put down um, regional powers. Um, but we should be under no uh, illusions that it was an inefficient and corrupt and slow system. Mm. But because it had no rivals, it allowed Constantinople to centralize power and money in a way that Western European states couldn't. Um, so purely in that sense, um, it was more advanced. It, it had records that that controlled the whole territory on an even basis. You didn't have um, exceptions. You know, well, in in the West they pay taxes in a different way to the East. It 
standardized. Um, but yeah, it, so it, it's a it's a different model. It 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 allowed Byzantium to survive in a way that, say, the Carolingian Empire would disintegrate. But um, I might just I'm I'm sounding a word of caution. Just that mm -hmm. it didn't guarantee that Byzantium was more powerful its neighbors you know it it was still subject to political and uh natural disruption um in ways that didn't make it you know 10 times more advanced than than yeah. western european states but just it was more efficiently centralized and i believe one of the things that i think um you know i think you've talked about in the past is the fact that the center was so strong and it was so centralized means that actually it, it, it in a way makes civil war more likely because the prize of of being emperor is so much stronger than being say king of france yeah and i think there's perhaps i mean obviously western europe was was constantly at war but there were perhaps alliances and and exceptions there you know people would accept um that assassinating a king was an immoral or you know a, a sinful act in a way that somehow didn't develop in byzantium that um political elites continued to maneuver around the emperor kill him then the new emperor was accepted as the the choice of the elites i mean obviously do listen to the podcast if you want to unpick that mm -hmm. one completely but um yeah, it, it's this kind of coalition of elites um, making the prize at the top both powerful and vulnerable at the same time. Whereas in a system where every region has its own lord who is armed, there is a sense of stability in that at, at times where, well, we can't overthrow the center because there's too many obstacles to get to yeah. standing in our way. And I would say, by the way, I think one of the strengths of the History of Byzantium podcast is the way that you bring scholarship in in an unobtrusive way um, and an accessible way um, so that we kind of look that you, you kind of take listeners through that sort of discussion. Um, just a little, I don't know, a little plug for you there. But, yeah, um, thank you. I think it's it's something that definitely I try and aspire to on here to some extent. Um one thing that um, kind of, I think, as well as, as, as making a civilization worthy of study or attracting people to it, is the importance of a, a city and a capital. You know, when people think about um, Victorian Britain, I think they're mostly thinking about Victorian London and that image in their head um, so much sums up, you know, that topic and equally you could say it for Weimar Germany Berlin in the 1920s is I think everyone's or anyone who kind of knows a bit about it that's what they think of um, and it kind of symbolizes the whole I mean I can't really call 1920s Germany a civilization but if you see what I mean um, so what makes Constantinople unique and what what do you think so because I think when we study Byzantium as well, we are very much studying Constantinople as well. Um, why is that a city that I think exercised magnetism over people who, who look at Byzantium? Um, I think at a time when um, medieval European cities had largely shed the monumental Roman architecture for more practical, um, smaller, less durable structures. Mm -hmm. Constantinople maintained this core of buildings and monuments that had been built in the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries when the empire was a superpower and so could pay for crews of, you know, 10,000 laborers to to build things. So if you came from the medieval West and your local church was a uh, mostly wooden basilica that could seat 
couple of hundred people. Um, then you turned up in Constantinople and there was a building the size of modern cathedrals mm. in stone. Um, and we have reports from Western visitors, you know, who were just amazed at the sheer number of structures of that size and magnitude. There were um, these freestanding sculptural columns. So um, today you might have seen Trajan's column in Rome where it's uh, just a, a column with spiral relief showing scenes of war carved all the way to the top. And um, there were two, three, four of those in, in Constantinople that visitors would come and see and just be astonished by. Um, and yeah, of course, the, the Hagia Sophia, the, or Hagia Sophia, as you'll probably read it, this giant cathedral church that was the largest church in, in the world for about a thousand years. Um, so it, it was visually impressive and it had these huge walls. Um, uh, when you would pass through, it had these huge harbors full of ships um, because it was this great harbor location between Europe and Asia. And um, there was a lot of money flowing around. I suppose that's another difference between a, the states of Western Europe, where a lot of obligations on, say, the peasantry were in terms of food and fodder for horses and, um, you know, make me armor or, you know, uh, leather for um, saddles and things, and that'll be your payment of tax to me. Whereas in Byzantium, um, tax payments were all, well, all almost always in coin. And mm -hmm. so you had all these ships coming in paying a, a harbor tax and so um visitors were often just wowed by you know here's the uh the duke of normandy coming to visit and the emperor would say ah oh, do, do you want this chest full of coins like you know to help you on your on your journey and you would think how has this man got so much money um and of course you know you you realize the emperors are thinking well he's gonna have to spend all that money buying food from my subjects who will then pay it back to me in tax so i uh, you know it's no problem to hand yeah. out these gifts um and i suppose the other thing particularly for medieval christians was the sheer amount of relics in constantinople you know pieces of um the, the cross christ was crucified on supposedly and you know bones from saints and martyrs which were housed in churches um you know so this was this was a, a rich city a monumental city and a holy city so it made you know a big impression on the time Yeah, it's one of those um, places that you kind of, in history, that I think history enthusiasts kind of wish they could could have seen mm. in its day. And actually, um, I think in a couple of your episodes, you kind of almost try and do that and you paint a kind of semi-fictional picture of what it would have been like walking through the city. As, as I think people did refer to it then, just as the city. Yeah. Um, which kind of again in emphasizes the standing it had yeah one um other aspect um that i've looked into to some extent and found really interesting um is that you get quite a few instances through byzantine history which as far as i know is quite unusual for medieval history of um women actually playing quite a prominent role in politics um there's well there's a few great examples that i'm sure you know robin can tell us more about um we already hinted at irene the empress who had her own son blinded so she could keep ruling once he came of age um there's the famous or maybe infamous um theodora wife of justinian um i kind of looked up during my university study, the 11th century, where there's a whole kind of host of, of women um, who have a prominent political role. Um, I don't know, Robin, what, what, why do you think that was... Is there any reasons that you think that was more prevalent in Byzantium? Yeah. I mean, this is something I, I, I want to study more in depth um, because the Byzantines were just as... Um, misogynistic as yeah as anyone as anyone um you read michael zelos and it's quite clear that it's traumatic having all these women at the top oh yeah well I, my, my favorite was um 
uh, I think it's Emperor Leo the Sixth who who's marrying who's married three times and his wives die before giving him an heir and um, he has a baby with his mistress and he's kind of testing the ground. It's like okay, I finally got a healthy son, maybe I can marry her and the, the churchman is saying no, you can't because you know marrying this many times is an affront. And one of them writes him, <laughs> uh, you know, here's here's why you shouldn't marry this woman. And he says, you know, she's given you a son. Just think of her like a piece of fruit. You know, you've got the bit you wanted. Now discard the, uh, the skin. Oh, oh. And it's like, yeah, that's oh, nice. Wow. Um, <laughs> so they're just as misogynistic as any, you know, anyone else at the time. But um, uh, the we come back to this kind of centralized state. So if you're the, if you're the Duke of Normandy or whoever, you have to be a, a military man because your job involves, you know, riding around your uh, estates, making sure there's no trouble fighting off people who might be trying to invade. If you're the ruler of Constantinople, you don't really have to leave your bedroom because you've got an army, you've got an, you've got bureaucrats. As long as people are supporting you you can give orders and stay where you are and so this opens the door for um women to have a role in politics because if you can give orders uh from the palace and have them accepted then why can't your wife give orders or your daughter give orders or your sister give orders and the there is um a sense that if you're part of the royal family then you have power you have a right to be involved to some extent but really it comes down to these kind of coalitions of political support that um say the emperor has appointed all his generals and his bureaucrats and lots of people in the elites are happy with this situation and then the emperor suddenly dies as people did all the time in the evil times well he, say his wife then says listen I'll take over and I promise I'll keep you all in the jobs you're in now. Well, that sounds like a good deal because you might say, well, we really, we really should, you know, appoint old Sergius over there. He's very senior. He should become the new emperor. And then you go, well, hang on. Sergius, his whole family will then need jobs. And, you know, he's got all those friends back in, you know, his home province. They'll want jobs. You know, let's stick with, um, you know, the current emperor's widow because she'll keep us in power. And so you have these situations where women sometimes rule for years or have a heavy influence in government because so many men basically are in positions where they are part of a of a coalition with her. And so they, they will actively seek her support. And by virtue of her relationship to a, a male emperor, a husband, whoever, they are seen by the crowds as a part of the royal family and a legitimate ruler. And so repeatedly we find women staying in power in ways they just wouldn't be able to in a, in a decentralized state where the person in charge had to be a male warrior. Yeah. I think um, one of the examples that I found, find really fascinating is um, the Empress Zoe in the 11th century who in 1042, the um, new emperor, Michael V, tries to basically get rid of her. She's um, his uh, basically aunt. Is yeah, um, I think so. And when the people of Constantinople find out that Michael V is going to ship out his old aunt and take power for himself, there's a popular uprising in which thousands are killed, in which over several days they manage to overpower the imperial forces and restore her to the throne. And I think, judging by the all the chroniclers of the period, who I'm not going to try and say because my Greek pronunciation will embarrass me, um, but they all kind of feel that this is some massive worthy event, but they they, I think there's, in a sense of all of them, they struggle to really explain it. Um, the idea that, you know, the, mo the mob, the mass of the city, of a medieval city, feel that a woman has more right to be their ruler than the emperor. 
um, and that they're willing to fight and die over several days for that sense of kind of loyalty. Yeah. Well, the, that's a great example. I mean, you look at um, Queen Elizabeth II today. Um, and those of you who've watched The Crown, you know, will will have seen this, that um, you have a an, you have someone born uh, as a princess and you're all, you know, oh, look at the, you know, look at the cute baby and they're they're your child, you know, in, in a celebrity mm-hmm. way. And then they grow up. And so by the time they are, 50 or 60 as Zoe was and, you know, 90 or odd as the queen is now, they've now been around for the lifetime of most people and they've become a fixture. And in a city like Constantinople where um, the the city is everything, the mob has power. And so exactly as you describe, um, Zoe marries a man, he dies, his nephew takes power and says, let's get Zoe out. The people say, hang on, we don't know you at all but she's been around my whole life and so they rally around her um you know again not really in a because she'll she has good policies way just in Mm. a she's our sovereign she's one of us she was born here and has lived here all her life and we want who we know rather than um the new person and so again it feels very much like the behavior in in modern democracies um you know uh, say what you will about uh, donald trump we know who he is he's been on tv for years he's been, he's he's had cameos in lots of sitcoms and tv shows like he's familiar we, we that counts for something in politics so yeah that that definitely played in favor of of so many female figures who who were able to ex, uh, exercise power it's opening that mirror back to the past again which echoes the modern world yeah exactly and i another fantastic historical comparison i need to be writing these down between <laughs> Zoe and donald trump um yeah i think um it is i think i i totally agree that it, it's the sense that this is a state that doesn't need to be led by a warrior um which allows it to happen and then there's the idea as well of of being, although it is quite loose in both the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, of inheritance, of inheriting the throne. It's never really clarified by anyone <laughs> how that actually works, despite the Roman and then Byzantine Empire existing for the best part of 1500 years. Um, but there is a vague sense of legitimacy conferred by birth. Um, and I think those factors help to create a, a situation where in some circumstances you can have um, women as, as political, as political actors, I suppose. Um, and for those listening who might be uninitiated in Byzantine history, um, I think a, a starting, an eyebrow raising starting point might be the Empress Theodora. Um but yeah, we, we might leave that one there. <laughs> um, so, Robin, we are going to be cruel now and put you through some quick fire questions. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to say a most or worst or best in history. Um, and we want you to respond with your gut instinct, the first thing that comes into your head. Um, So it's very unfair. It's very unscientific. (laughs) um, But that's kind of the point. Um, So it can be from your specialist area. It doesn't have to be. Um, But could you tell us, Robin, um, history's most incompetent ruler? (laughs) Um. Wow, that's just so much to choose from. Um, I guess the dull answer would probably be uh, Caligula. Uh, when you alienate so many people so thoroughly um, that they that they overthrow you and no one mourns your loss. That's a fair answer. I mean, to be fair, our um, people who have come on and done it so far have been 
reaching for some of the, let's say, the ones that come to mind straight away, which is kind of what we're asking. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting to see see what people say. Um, if that was, if Caligula is the most incompetent, what about the worst, the worst leader? <laughs> the worst leader in history. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a name that comes to mind. I'm trying not it just pick the most <laughs> obvious. It, does um, it begin with H? Yeah, <laughs> it does. But it does. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure there have been worse leaders who who kind of just marched straight off the edge of a cliff or something. But <laughs> since I, I want to be quick, I'll say Hitler and be boring. That's three for three, I That's think. That. That's a hat trick for Hitler. I mean, yeah. you're going to be <laughs> delighted with that. Um, history's best general. Well, I think uh, you have to say Alexander the Great because everyone, uh, everyone in the centuries after him said that. Mm. Um, he, I think he. Uh, he surprised the world in retrospect with how how much conquering one army can do um mm. pre pre gunpowder just by um attacking and attacking and and your opponents thinking well we've lost he'll he'll accept a negotiated settlement now and him saying no i won't and uh, that spreads a certain amount of panic that then led him to conquer you know half the known world so i i will not dispute the great title. I mean that is a very strong answer, and it definitely um, pushes pushes hard against who we've had a few times, which is Napoleon. Um, because I think Alexander. I mean, it's one of those stories that I think a lot of people who are enthusiastic about history will learn about Alexander the Great quite early yeah. on, maybe. Um, but it's it's one that's worth going back to because it, every time I think you look back at it, it's more staggering of what he managed to achieve. Um, in, in basically, you know, little more than a decade, really, because he died at was it thirty two something Quite like young. that, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and like you say, in, in, in the ancient world, before not just gunpowder, but you know, transportation, um, mm. infrastructure to to be able to pull off the kind of feats and conquests that he did. Let's have one more. Um, history's most complex or complicated event you've come across. Uh, mm. Something that really took you a lot to get your head around. I mean, from my period of study, I would say the, the origins of Islam. Mm. Um, I mean, it depends how you define complicated. What well, you know, There is a reason that people do not study that in detail um uh, and hopefully one day in the future they will and we'll learn more and um i certainly don't wish to uh tread on any more toes but it is fascinating and yeah. i think I, I talked about it recently with regards to the crusades that what add such a layer of complexity is when humans achieve something astonishing that surprises themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. attribute it to god as as all pre-modern people did and then write down history backwards mm. you start you yeah. start with an end point you go god wanted us you know i mean in the example of alexander the great you might have said um the gods favored alexander why so you look backwards and go, oh, well, he did this. They must have loved that. And they did this. The gods must have loved that. Yeah. Well, you get a lot of that um, with the origins of Islam, which leads to confusion. Um, you know, the, the, the Arab armies conquered, like it's the most astonishing conquest in history. Um, mm -hmm. Even more astonishing than Alexander, done person, um, you know, and is the reason that Islam has spread from Arabia all the way to Indonesia. Um, all the way to Morocco in the other direction and so on. It, it, it was astounding. And so to try and comprehend that as a historian sitting down 200 years later was a task that was incredibly complex. So I'll go for that. It's a good, it's a good, um, 
good choice. Uh, I think it's something that, and as well, that I think a lot of, you know, if I have the liberty of saying us in the Western world just don't really have mm. any, there's no popular understanding of it at all. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, we're all the poorer for that. Oh, yeah. It, it reminds me actually of, of literally one of the, my favorite history books of all time um, that I can just read again and again and again called The World of Late Antiquity by Peter Brown. Um, Fantastic. It, 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 that is one of the things it covers in, in it just really helped to illuminate so much um, for me, not just about Islam. I mean, it, one of the lines in it is something like, you know, historians do well to remember that the subjects they write about spend half of their existence asleep. And when <laughs> they're asleep, they dream. And it's just one of those moments as a historian just think, I have never thought about this ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, you're absolutely right, by the way, that it's, it's such a well-written book and it, it stands out for how succinct he can be you know in terms of phrase and it's just really really nice to read so it's a definitely... fantastic read you you feel yeah. like you're being taken along a journey of enlightenment <laughs> yeah reading it, of just of doing that very difficult thing which i think the best history does um which is getting back to the root of what history is in the sense of it's the study of human beings and trying to understand those human beings and something that came out in the interview with Gary actually as well was about history being worked backwards and I think we're all very guilty of that today you know we see even in modern history things like well to use a topic I'm familiar with and I've used before in this interview Weimar Germany the whole thing is you can't I feel like we can't study it well today because it ends with the Nazis and everything right. about Weimar Germany is but it's leading up to the Nazis, yeah. but couldn't they see that this was going to have, you know, every aspect of it is foreshadowed by, we know the end. And yet, of course, the people living it were living their lives forwards, um, not backwards. And they couldn't see, you know, even a week into the future, <laughs> never mind years. So I think that book, and I think history more generally, it's just most effective when it tries to put yourself in that sense of the way people were thinking at the time and experiencing it forwards. Well, I think if you're not convinced after all of that, that Byzantium is an underrated civilization of great significance that is worthwhile your time, then, you know, I'll be, I'm sorry. I can't. Yeah, I'll be impressed. <laughs> I'd be impressed if you can come up with a more underrated civilization than Yeah, that. I think so much of, of what we've talked about this episode is about how A, it's interesting, but B, it's so significant mm. to many of the popular themes, more popular themes, I should say, of history that we study. So, so I, all that remains really is to say thank you so much, Robin, for coming on. Um, it's been... I hope for our listeners, but certainly for me, a really interesting and enlightening mm. chat. Hey, it's been a huge pleasure to talk about Byzantium with you, and uh, thank you for having me. Of course, please, please check out the History of Byzantium podcast. Um, there will be a link to it down in the description, uh, because it, it is a good podcast. Absolutely. Um and it's one of the, like I think I said at the top, one of the kind of uh, longest running, mm. um, which I think speaks a lot to both your kind of dedication to your subject, Robin, but also the the rich detail and the the sheer kind of quantity that there is when we look at Byzantine history of, of stuff to get your teeth into. Um, so all that remains is to say, um, that thank you once again to Robin and I have been Peter and I've been Alex and thank you for listening to History's Most. Mm -hmm.